In this video, we are going to take a look at electron backscattering in the scanning electron microscope. Starting with a little bit of SEM basics and electron sample interaction, we can then focus on some of the main methods for detecting backscattered electrons, the signals they generate, and the types of information we can derive from these signals. As we have seen in other videos on SEM, a beam of primary electrons is accelerated towards a sample and focused using electromagnetic lenses. The beam is raster scanned across the sample, which produces several different types of output radiation. The output beams are measured by a number of different detectors in the vacuum chamber. Here we see a diagram of the primary electron beam interacting with the sample surface. The electron beam hits the surface and excites a volume in the sample. Throughout the interaction volume, we can see the production of secondary electrons, backscattered electrons, low-loss electrons, Auger electrons, cathodoluminescence, transmitted electrons, absorbed electrons, and characteristic x-rays. But we will focus on backscattered electrons, which I might call BSEs for short. These signals arise through a number of scattering processes, making the total electron diffusion very difficult to calculate. However, the range of electron depth in the sample is generally proportional to the electron energy, atomic weight, density, and atomic number. Backscattered electrons tend to lose more energy as they propagate further into the sample. So the maximum usable information depth of backscattered electrons is often on the order of half of the total electron range. Backscattered electrons are primary electrons that undergo one or more elastic scattering events and are ejected from the sample at a large angle, usually through the same surface as the source beam. Because there are many possible interactions and electrons can be ejected from many points on the sample surface, it is difficult to separate types of electron emission from one another. As a convention, backscattered electrons are said to be those ejected from the sample with energy greater than 50 electron volts and anywhere up to the energy of the incident electron beam. Secondary electrons are those ejected with less than 50 electron volts. Due to their high energy, backscattered electrons travel on straight line trajectories and are not strongly influenced by electric fields or sample charging. This has some specific implications for the methods of detection that we will take a look at later. The primary forces at work in electron backscattering are described by charge particle interaction between the nucleus of sample atoms and the incident electron. In the classical picture, we can treat the electron as a small particle incident on the nucleus that experiences a force given by Coulomb's law. For our application, we want to find the distribution of electrons after interacting with the nucleus, called the scattering cross-section. Electrons passing through an area of d sigma are scattered through a solid angle of d omega with the differential cross-section given by d sigma over d omega. To be more complete, we must include the wave nature of the incident electron beam, along with several other factors, such as screening by the electron cloud, electron spin interactions, and inelastic recoil of the nucleus. These additional inelastic scattering processes are fully accounted for in Mott scattering. In a wave mechanics picture, we should view the primary electron beam as a plane wave, which creates a scattered spherical wave. The scattered wave picks up a phase shift described by the scattering amplitude f of theta, the square of which is related to the differential cross-section. In both cases, we know that the scattering strength largely depends on the charge of the nucleus, which is related to the atomic number, z. If we were to scan over two large ingots of gold and silver in the SEM, at the center of the two, the backscattered electron detector would see a collection of electrons leaving both the gold and the silver. With good resolution and proper use of the detector, we could see contrast from the two metals, where the larger, heavier metal, gold, will scatter more strongly and therefore appear to be brighter in our image. Specks of dust on the surface, which are composed mostly of carbon, will appear to be very dark. Because of the high energy straight line trajectories that we mentioned earlier, detection of backscattered electrons depends on line of sight collection of the signal. To maximize line of sight, backscattered electron detectors are placed under the final aperture or in line with the electron beam. The detectors are generally either solid state or scintillating configurations, which provide an output response proportional to the electron energy. 
This implies that backscattered electrons having higher energy will make large contributions to the signal. However, the system will see any electrons that interact with the detector, and the output signal will integrate any number of the possible scattering processes. Dedicated solid-state detectors are one of the primary ways of detecting backscattered electrons. A biased PN junction is made in an annular configuration just under the final lens aperture. Electrons landing on the detector will generate current that can be measured with an amplifier circuit. If the annular detector is divided into quadrants, the signal from the individual quadrants can be added to produce increasing atomic number contrast or subtracted to produce stronger topological contrast. Backscattered electron detection can also be realized using a scintillating device configuration very similar to that of the Everhart Thornley detector. A scintillating film is placed under the aperture and incident electrons cause the material to emit a photon proportional to the electron energy. This will be collected by a light pipe and fed into a photomultiplier tube. The PMT produces an electrical signal that can be amplified for image formation. Although the Everhart Thornley design is primarily used to detect secondary electrons due to their low energy, it will also detect any backscattered electrons propagating through the same solid angle. The Everhart Thornley detector uses a positive potential operating at approximately 300 volts to attract secondary electrons towards the detector. Another strong positive potential is used to accelerate electrons towards a scintillator, which will release a photon that is collected in a similar configuration to that mentioned earlier. This technique focuses on the amplification of topological information provided by secondary electrons, but can be used to see compositional information when collecting backscattered electrons. Traditionally, image formation was done by feeding the electrical signal output to a rastered cathode ray tube, but modern systems mostly use digital displays. The wave interaction of backscattered electrons with crystalline structures can be imaged as diffraction patterns in the SEM. The primary electron beam is held in place over a tilted sample, while backscattered electrons are collected over a large solid angle. Diffraction pattern detectors use a fluorescent screen to detect electrons and produce an optical signal. This light is focused onto a film for analog imaging or a CCD camera for digital imaging. Bunches of electrons will result in diffraction bands that can demonstrate the crystalline patterns of the material. In the SEM, the final signal used for image formation is a collection of electrons from any one or more of the scattering processes that can take place. In the most common methods of BSC detection, there is no direct ray path from the sample to the image as in optical imaging. In some cases, we collect the electrons as electrical information and in others as optical information. This data is used in coordination with the scan speed and location to reconstruct an image of the sample. Only in the diffraction patterning scheme do we see a direct ray path from sample to image, but this does not result in typical images, especially not those that are often associated with SEMs. So, while SEM micrographs look very familiar and they remind us of their optical counterparts, we have to keep in mind the physics and engineering that are used to create the images. So the next time you are looking at some high resolution images of pollen grains, electronic integrated circuits, or grain boundaries and phases in composite materials, remember the measurements made in the SEM. They're mostly electrical. While your eyes, which are optical devices, are key to understanding and interpreting your results, you are actually seeing a measurement of charged particles and their interaction with your sample. Thanks for watching.